Please stay tuned for important disclosure information at the conclusion of this episode. Hi, and welcome to The Long View. I'm Christine Benz, Director of Personal Finance for Morningstar. And I'm Jeff Patak, Chief Ratings Officer for Morningstar Research Services. Our guest on the podcast today is tax and retirement planning expert, Jeffrey Levine. Jeff is the Chief Planning Officer for Buckingham Strategic Wealth. He's also the lead financial planning nerd at Kitsis.com, home of the popular Nerd's Eye View blog. Jeff recently launched a podcast with Ed Slott called The Great Retirement Debate. He has authored several books, including The Baby Boomer's Guide to Savvy IRA Planning, The Financial Advisor's Guide to Savvy IRA Planning, and The Definitive Guide to Required Minimum Distributions for Baby Boomers. Jeff is a frequent public speaker and media commentator and maintains a high profile on social media and on the Nerds Eye View blog, where he readily shares tax and retirement planning insights. Think Advisor recently named Jeff Thought Leader of the Year for 2022. Jeff, welcome back to The Long View. Oh, it's great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Well, it's great to have you back. We had you on shortly after we launched the podcast, and there are lots of new developments to cover with you. Um, We want to start by talking about your podcast, which you recently launched with Ed Slott. It's called The Great Retirement Debate. You each argue one side of some retirement-related questions, such as whether to file for Social Security early, various tax matters. I'm curious, how do you decide which questions or what debates that you and Ed want to tackle? Well, when we when we first started talking about the idea, it was very much a, you know, what are the questions that come to us most often from consumers and the advisors that we speak with on a regular basis? You know, what are they seeing in the field? What are the problems that people are having where, you know, they're just looking for an understanding of what they should potentially do. And and that comes first from educating themselves about the benefits and drawbacks of any potential options. So that's where the initial group came from. And then, of course, now, since we've launched, we are actively soliciting and taking suggestions for future topics. We've uh, recorded a couple already from people that people have submitted as a proposed topic, which has been great. We love to see the feedback. And I'm sure that, uh, you know, there's just, when it comes to retirement, there's no shortage of things to discuss. So uh, I don't anticipate we'll run out of topics anytime soon. (laughs) What have been some of your favorite conversations or topics that you've taken on so far? Well, I mean, the Social Security one we launched with as our first episode, just because it's relevant to so many individuals, and it's still such a, a hotly debated, you know, subject. And I think far more, you know, personally now, I'm, I'm obviously showing my cards as to which side of the debate I tend to be on for more people than not. Obviously, every situation is different. But, you know, I I still find that far too many people claim Social Security far too early. So that was that was a really fun one. I've enjoyed a couple of them where I've had to argue against what I really believe. Uh, You know, that's always a challenge, but it's um, it's a fun challenge to try and figure out what it is that I can say that, you know, if I was trying to argue with myself, how would I try to uh, how would I try and beat me in a debate? And so that's been really exciting to try and look at the other side of things. And and that's really what the the show is all about. It's to highlight both sides because everyone's situation is different. You know, our kind of tagline is, you know, there are two sides to every coin, but your particular decisions are too important to leave up to a coin flip. And that's why we always encourage individuals to reach out to knowledgeable financial advisors, tax advisors, legal professionals to help them work through some of life's more difficult decisions. A question I had is, the convention of the podcast is that you two are kind of having an argument or a spirited debate. Are there any major issues in retirement planning that you and Ed disagree on? I know you worked together for a long time. Um, yeah, I mean, I, it'd be hard. I'd be hard pressed to say there's nothing we don't uh, we don't disagree on. I think um, Ed, by his very nature, is is slightly more conservative in his approach towards retirement in general than than I am, and and some of that probably has to do with our age. You know, he likes to point out a lot that there's a a bit of a generational gap between us, and we perhaps see the world through different eyes because of that. Um, I wonder how much of that is the generation gap versus how much of it is just simply our uh, our personalities and how we go about uh, approaching things. But I would say on most of the big issues, we really do see eye to eye on on most things. And and you mentioned, you know, we worked together for a long time. I would say, you know, I, I 
trained. That's probably a good way to say it. I trained under Ed for for many years before kind of branching out and going different ways. And so, you know, it, it's it's kind of like the NFL coaching tree. I, I always joke around like that, where, you know, everybody has kind of a different flavor of how they do things. But if you look at the, you know, the Bill Parcells coaching tree, or you look at the Andy Reid coaching tree, some of the, the great coaches in NFL history, a lot of their, uh, you know, a lot of their assistant coaches and position coaches that have gone on to do amazing things in their own right, they've done it in a very similar way. And to that end, I think Ed and I, for the most part, uh, we'd probably be in real life be arguing on the same side of the coin more times than not. We wanted to shift gears and talk about notable changes for 2023. And, and maybe it makes sense to start with what's changing tax-wise for 2023. We have a lot of inflation-related changes going into effect, higher 401k and IRA contribution amounts, for example. What do you think are the main things that sort of jump out when you think about what's changing for 2023 and what, you know, should financial advisors and individual investors have on their radars? Sure. I think inflation is a big one and you hit on it. Uh, 2022 will be remembered for a year of significant inflation where we went from having basically little to no inflation for for many years uh, to you know rather significant inflation. It seemed like almost overnight. Uh, and of course, along with that inflation came along higher interest rates to try and fight back inflation, et cetera. And so lots of uh, lots of challenges there and opportunities. So you mentioned a couple of them, which is we've got some significant bumps in the inflation adjusted amounts that individuals can contribute to retirement accounts. The uh, the inflation adjusted numbers for things like who can make deductible IRA contributions or who can make Roth IRA contributions are also up significantly. But beyond that, I would say for retirees, you know, while 2022 certainly saw a significant amount of inflationary pressure eating away at retirees' spending, from December 31st of 2022 to January 1st of 2023, it's not like that inflation took effect overnight, right? It was gradual throughout the year. But from December 31st of 2022 to January 1st of 2023, effectively overnight, there were some significant changes. For instance, a sizable bump up in social security benefits for those who are receiving them, coupled with the unusual situation, despite inflationary pressures, of Medicare premiums actually going down. And so that actually, from December of 2022 to January of 2023, retirees will feel a pretty significant, or did feel a, a pretty significant increase in their spendable dollars. Now, again, that's just kind of catching up for what may have been lost in 2022, but that was a gradual thing where, again, overnight from December to January, all of a sudden, people got bigger checks and had less amount taken out of those checks for Medicare. That's a pretty sizable win and gives a number of retirees a good amount more of spendable dollars here in 2023 than they had in 2022. Well, sticking with that, Jeff, at the other side of the ledger, people who are still working and earning paychecks will see a bigger share of their income taxed for Social Security tax. Is that correct? That's correct, of course. Yeah, as we get uh, wage inflation and so forth, uh, you, you see more of those dollars taxed for Social Security up to the annual limit each year. That, that's been a discussion for years in Washington as to whether we should eliminate it, whether it should be increased, or there's even been talks uh, from time to time of creating kind of a donut hole where we would have the uh, limit that we have today, then a, a brief period where those with higher earnings wouldn't pay anymore, but then discussions of sometimes whether we should bring it back for those who earn more than 400000 or so forth. Those have just been proposals. I don't think uh, they're going to happen today, but we are going to have to do something here in, uh, in the relatively near future to ultimately deal with the fact that Social Security is, you know, right now scheduled to see its trust fund exhausted within the next decade or so. And, and I, I like to say the trust fund exhausted as opposed to go broke, because going broke you know, gives the connotation that there's nothing left. The reality is even if we did nothing, 
uh, retirees would still get about, you know, 75 to 80 cents on the dollar that they were promised, which is certainly not what anybody wants, but it's a lot better than getting zero cents on the dollar. So that continues to be a, an interesting discussion to have with uh, those in retirement now as well as those who are approaching is how do we think about social security and how much should we count in it as part of an individual's financial plan as we move forward? When there's pending legislation in Congress related to taxes, how do you figure out what might realistically find passage and what's probably dead in the water? Do you have, do you have sources on Capitol Hill or do you find other means of sort of keeping apprised and, and making good calls? Uh, you know, I think it's a, a combination of many factors. So certainly uh, some good connections with some folks who are tied into Washington politics. Uh, that's always a help. Obviously, you know, I try to just read everything I can get my hands on. And then you kind of get a sense as to what else is on, uh, you know, what is on the legislative docket. Now, here in 2023 and into 2024, I think it's safe to say that I expect a lot less of significance to happen here, just because we don't have one party controlling all elements of Washington anymore, right? For a few years here, we had Democrats controlling the, the House, the Senate with the narrowest of margins in the White House, and they were able to do some things, not as much as they had hoped because of the slim majority, um, but they were able to do some uh, some significant things. The Inflation Reduction Act in 2022 did, you know, was was pretty meaningful for a, a number of reasons, uh, perhaps not the home run that Democrats had hoped for after the 2000 uh, elections, but still uh, meaningful legislation. But now with, you know, kind of a, a divided House and Senate, I, I think it's likely we're going to see gridlock. And, you know, that also brings me to to discussing or perhaps bringing up one of the most common questions I've been seeing lately and, and receiving is what's going to happen here at the end of 2025. So, you know, as you both know, Christine, Jeff, we've got the sunset of many of the changes made by the Tax Cut and Jobs Act from 2017. And that lowered taxes for the overwhelming majority of Americans. Well, it stands to reason that if changes expire that lowered taxes for the overwhelming majority of Americans, that if they expire, we're going to see higher taxes for the majority of Americans. And people keep saying, do they, will they get extended? What's going to happen? And obviously, you know, my crystal ball is no less cloudy than anyone else's. But if we're looking at Washington, especially a divided Congress right now, I think it's always better to bet on the under in terms of uh, new pieces of legislation, things happening. Every once in a while, you're wrong. You know, it's a probability thing. Every once in a while, Congress actually passes something and they move some piece of legislation forward. But if you're forced to take the over or under on Washington legislation, especially when one party is not in complete control, the under is always the best bet. So I think we're likely to see an expiration of those, or at least the majority of those provisions as scheduled, at least right now. I guess a counterpoint, though, Jeff, is that it seems like Congress, regardless of who's in charge, is disinclined to raise taxes on anyone. It seems like that's been a recurrent theme over the past couple of decades. You know, I think the carried interest loophole, the fact that it's still alive and well is maybe <laughs> exhibit A of that. So what do you think about that? Is is that just perhaps the path of least resistance for Congress, that it just doesn't feel good to raise taxes on people and so they don't? Yeah, I think that's part of it. Um, obviously, you've got politics at play. and uh, But I, I would also say that, uh, you know, in 2010, we did see the healthcare acts. And as part of that, the 3.8% surtax was created. And that had a material impact on a lot of higher net worth uh, families. There was a significant push by Democrats uh, in 2021 and then into 2022 to raise taxes. They just needed another vote or two in the Senate. You know, that would have easily gotten through the House and could have seen higher tax rates and an ending of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act changes. And, you know, part of it also is uh, when things expire, 
or you go back to where they were? Is it a tax rate increase or is it getting rid of the tax cut? You know, it's all a matter of how you spin it, right? If you're a Republican, you argue, look at this, the Democrats are raising the taxes again. And if you're a Democrat, you just argue, we're not raising taxes, we're just getting rid of that tax cut that the, the Republicans gave all the rich people. Now, again, which side of the aisle you happen to sit on is your own personal preference. But those are kind of the arguments that both sides make. Uh, I, I do think, you know, raising taxes is challenging from a political perspective, but you cannot, you know, I, I think even the most fervent supporter of modern monetary theory, which, you know, basically states that you don't really have to balance what comes in with what goes out each year. And I'm oversimplifying, but even the most fervent supporter of MMT, modern monetary theory, would tell you that there's a limit, right, to the amount of, of deficit you can run, to the amount of inflation you can drive up before that no longer works effectively. So I do think that at some point, even if they don't want to, Washington and Congress are going to have to tighten the belt and they're going to have to raise taxes on at least some folks to cover what we're looking to do here as a country. I guess this would cut in the opposite direction, but we did want to ask you about state and local taxes in 2021. There, there did seem to be some energy around the idea of repealing the cap on state and local tax deductions that's currently in place. What's the status of that? Um, well, the status as we sit here right now is that it is here and uh, it, like the, the salt cap of $10,000 remains. And I think it is exceedingly unlikely to see that change. Now that we have, uh, you know, Republicans in control of the House, it would take something pretty special that the Democrats would have to concede to get Republicans to budge on that issue. So that is not likely to change. Now, as I say that, though, that doesn't mean that there are no other ways in which individuals can look to mitigate that. In fact, there are uh, many states that have created workarounds for not all taxpayers, but some. Notably, small business owners in many states have the ability to pay taxes at the business level, which is not subject to the $10,000 limit, and then effectively receive a credit for their personal state income taxes. So it is a workaround that's quite effective and works in you know quite a number of states now. About maybe a third of states have something that, that looks a little bit like that. And remember, not all states even have a state income tax. So it is an effective tool where it is in existence. People should look and see whether it would apply to them. Uh, but for most individuals, we're only talking about those who would be uh, small business owners who have some sort of you know S corporation or uh, partnership or something like that. So it, it is a consideration that those in that situation should look into, but does not unfortunately apply to everyone. One uh, strategy that sometimes comes up in this context of trying to alleviate the pain associated with that SALT tax cap is this idea of bunching deductions together into a given year. It seems like every tax savvy person is very enthusiastic about this idea of bunching. Can you discuss that as well as how people should decide when? to bunch their deductions? Yeah. So I think I would start by, you know, just framing what bunching is, right? It is if we imagine that we have a, a household that has, you know, $15,000 of expenses that qualify for itemized deductions each year. Well, if, if it's a married couple, unfortunately, you know, the $27,000 roughly deduction amount that some of them would have, you know, or, or this year, uh, almost $30,000 here in 2023. Well, in that case, you know, you're not going to ever exceed your standard deduction amount, which means even though you have these expenses that kind of qualify for itemized deductions, you're not seeing a tax benefit. But if you were somehow able to take three years worth of expenses and squish them together, if you will, so $15,000 times three, well, now in one year, you have $45,000 of eligible expenses. That is higher than your standard deduction. And so you can get a tax benefit. And maybe the next two years afterwards, you just go back to the standard deduction. You kind of alternate. So one year you do the squish the deductions together. A few years you take the standard deduction. Then another year you squish them together again. Uh, in terms of you know whether or not this works, well, it certainly works for those who have the ability to more or less control those itemized deductions. But whether you squish deductions or not, you're still subject to the same $10,000 maximum limit on state and local taxes. So even if you kind of 
push together maybe property tax bills from a couple of years. It doesn't matter. You can't get over $10,000. Your mortgage interest is what your mortgage interest is. You can't really bunch that. So when we're talking about bunching, it often comes down to two types of expenses. Medical expenses, which for most people are not deductible anyway, uh, because they're not spending more than seven and a half percent of their adjusted gross income. And if you don't spend more than seven and a half percent of that adjusted gross income amount, you don't get to deduct anything as a medical expense. The other one is charity. And even there, again, charity, even if you bunch, it's tough sometimes to bunch enough to get above that standard deduction amount. So a lot of people today, even with bunching, still can't get higher than their standard deduction. And for those individuals, it just you don't have to worry about it. Now, if you're someone who gives away a significant amount of money each year, or perhaps you are uh, someone who has recently purchased a, a home with a significant mortgage, and so your interest is uh, not only, you know, are you getting maybe $750,000 of a mortgage that is subject to interest, you know, where you're getting a deduction, but also interest rates are higher than they were. So, you know, that can create higher itemized deduction amounts, but we just don't see it quite as often as we used to. Again, even with mortgage interest, mortgage interest was so low for so long, it's only in the last year or so, you know, that we saw the interest rates shoot up. Mortgage rates were so low for so long that everybody refinanced 18 times to get to a lower rate. And so even the mortgage interest deduction that people had was lower than it would have been historically. So bunching is a great strategy where it works. It just doesn't work for that many people anymore which is why less than 10% of people today itemize their deductions. As we record this in late 2022, we're waiting to hear how the fate of a bill called, I think it's called informally secure 2.0, whether it would raise the age for required minimum distributions among other initiatives. Can you discuss some of the key provisions in the bill and, and handicap the likelihood that we'll see anything like that pass? Sure. So uh, I would say first, let's let's take the second question first. Handicap the likelihood. You know, I, I said I'd always take the under earlier, and so perhaps I'm going against my own rule here. But I, I think it is extremely likely um, that we see Secure Act 2.0 happen here in the new future, uh, near future rather. And in fact, I wouldn't be surprised if by the time this podcast is released, it's already there. So I think uh, it is a high degree of likelihood that it happens. I think it's most likely to happen late in 2022, as long as Congress gets together uh, and takes care of some things to keep the lights on, so to speak. I think they'll turn to the Secure Act 2.0. Now, the challenge is, um, as we sit here, you, you mentioned uh, Secure Act 2.0 is kind of what it's informally called, and that's because formally, it's actually three different bills that don't all align with each other. There's a House bill that passed earlier in 2022, overwhelmingly with more than 400 yes votes. Now, that is a rarity today in Washington to see both sides come together and pass something so, I don't want to say unanimously because it wasn't unanimous, but it was pretty darn close. Uh, for Washington standards, that's about as bipartisan as it gets in the House. Now, in the Senate, there are a couple of different bills that are sort of retirement related that have some similar provisions, some same provisions, some different provisions. So that's still kind of the rub here is will everybody be able to get together on these three bills and work everything out in time? I still say yes, but that's where the question comes in. Now, in terms of provisions that people should be aware of, the reason it's called Secure Act 2.0 informally is because we had Secure Act 1.0, or what I commonly call like the OG Secure Act, right? The, the original version. And as part of that original version, there was an elimination of the stretch IRA for most non-spouse beneficiaries. Not all. There's a couple people, select groups of individuals, such as persons who are chronically ill, persons who are disabled, uh, et cetera. But for most non-spouse beneficiaries, the stretch method of taking distributions from an inherited IRA or inherited 401k after someone died was eliminated and replaced with a new 10-year rule. Now, the challenge or that, that, that really kind of changed the landscape significantly for estate planning when it came to IRAs. And on the planning Richter scale, if you will, I would put that at a, you know, a seven and a half or maybe an eight is a pretty significant change. Now, I say that to compare Secure Act 2.0. I don't think there's any 
sevens or eights on the planning Richter scale there, things that are going to be so significant for so many people across the board uh, that it would it would rise to that level. But there are a lot of threes and fours and fives inside that bill. In fact, Secure Act 2.0 may contain more of those threes, fours, and fives than Secure Act 1.0 did. So what are some of those things? Well, you already mentioned one, which is perhaps a pushing back of the required minimum distribution age from 72 to uh, 75. Now, there are different thoughts on how to do that. Some proposals have said, let's do it gradually, uh, similar to like the way Social Security full retirement age was phased back from 66 to 67 in kind of smaller increments. So some people had a full retirement age of 66, others 66 in two months, others 66 in four months, and so forth. Now, one proposal would have the RMD age go from 72 for people today to 73 for some, to 74 for others, and then 75 for everyone else. Whereas other versions would just say, you know what, uh, beginning at some point in the future, generally early in the 2030s, we're going to make 75 the new RMD age uh, for everyone after that point. So uh, there are some differences in how to go about it, but pushing back the RMD age continues to be uh, a high priority item uh, as far as this bill goes. Some of the other things that are in the bill are Roth related. And I think that is a significant thing for a lot of people to hear is that not only does this bill not look to curtail the ability to go to a Roth, but if anything, it is encouraging or requiring uh, those individuals to use Roths more. So how could that be requiring? Well, one of the things it would do is versions of the bill would call for increased ability for catch-up contributions. Those are those special contributions that those who reach today, age 50, can add more to, let's say, their IRA or their 401k, et cetera. It would enhance the ability for some to make even additional plan level catch up contributions, but it would require some to make them in Roth contributions as opposed to pre tax contributions. It would create SEP and simple Roth IRA options, and it would allow employers for the first time to put matching contributions into Roth accounts. All of that has never been allowed before and uh, is just another sign that Congress doesn't want to get rid of the Roth, they want to keep the Roth. And I know that's a concern a lot of people have is, can I trust Congress to keep this thing around? It seems too good to be true. That's because you're thinking about things like a normal person and not like a Congress person. <laughs> Congress people only look at 10 years. That's the federal budget window, 10 years. And the Roth, you might say it's giving away the farm down the road. But who cares? Because it's after 10 years. It looks good today because it brings in money now. I would sit here and ask either of you to name me one provision, one, just one other provision that raises revenue for the federal government that people like. <laughs> you can't do it. Right? There, there is none. That's it. It's one. It's the Roth IRA. So it's not going anywhere, in my opinion. I'll give you one more that's in this bill uh, that I think when I, when I share this, you might at first say, wow, that sounds really good. I'm glad to see Congress doing that. I, however, am a cynical jerk and I don't like what they're doing, or I'm at least very leery of it. Uh, so Congress is considering taking the 50%, 5-0% penalty for missing an RMD and dropping it to 25%. Sounds great, right? You say, why does he like that? Well, in fact, they would even lower it further from 25%, the proposed lower amount, to just, quote unquote, 10% if someone fixed it in a timely fashion, if they fixed their mistake in a timely manner. Now, you, again, at first glance would say, well, how could that possibly be bad? What could he possibly not like about taking a 50% penalty that seems rather egregious and making it just 10%, taking it to, you know, just a fraction of what it was? Well, here's the thing. Today, because the penalty, in my opinion, is so egregious, I think the IRS, when you apply for relief, kind of feels almost an obligation that if, if you're 
trying to fix it and you realize you made a mistake, you know, by the way, at a point in people's lives when, you know, certainly not everybody who's 72 is cognitively impaired, but certainly that is a more likely age at which to start to see mental faculties begin to decline or, you know, like at that point in your life, I think Congress, or rather the IRS, is just kind of like, okay, give us any reason. Like, the dog ate my RMD. Okay, good. You get out of the penalty. But if they drop it to just 10%, I'm a little worried that the IRS is going to start to tighten the belt and not give relief anymore. So 50% penalty that no one pays, basically, because everybody can get out of it, seems a lot better to me than a 10% penalty that people you know, are actually required to pay. So that's the cynical part of me that's looking at this a little leery, saying, all right, what's really going on here? Yeah, good point. You've convinced me. I wanted to talk about um, some of the changes in Secure 2.0 that are aimed at making it easier for lower and middle income earners to save for retirement. It seems like anyone who looks at this retirement savings issue points to the fact that we've got a lot of people working who do not have any sort of employer provided plan. Do you have a favorite way to address this issue apart from or maybe including some of the things that are in Secure 2.0? So I'm actually going to go apart from Secure Act 2.0, and, and maybe it, it could help us a little bit. But, you know, my favorite issue for addressing this uh, is education. You know, that I think is the key here is education. It's why, you know, podcasts like yours it's why, you know, the articles that you all put out and so many others spend, you know, so much of their time and countless hours, you know, researching, writing, et cetera, uh, you know, getting people educated is absolutely critical. Look, access to workplace retirement plans is definitely important. And there are a lot of things in that bill, whether it's auto enrollment or whether it is getting more part-time workers mandatorily involved in their small business employer plans, increasing credits perhaps for businesses so that they are uh, more likely to adopt these plans. All those things are awesome. But if people aren't educated about why they need to invest and how it works, if they're scared of it, or they don't understand it. You know, people, we're humans. We, we, we're humans first. And if we don't understand something, we don't like to do it. It's just natural part of, uh, you know, of evolution. It's kept us safe for many years. And it's great when, you know, we don't want know what that big giant animal over there looks like and is going to do to us. It's great to stay away from it. But when we don't know what that big, scary market or investment or whatever it is is going to do, and we stay away from it, that hurts us for a long period of time. And so I think the very first thing we need to do is to continue to reach people at younger ages, whether that's in you know high school or in college, uh, to get into workplace environments as financial professionals and just educate people about the benefits of long-term investing, long-term saving, forming good habits, making good choices. You know, so often the folks that have the greatest success financially in life are not those who have this like one-time decision that they made that was an immediate windfall or they you know they they did this one thing that just worked out for them it's those who have made good decisions but small decisions repeatedly over and over for many years, decades in many cases, and that has produced the greatest results. So perhaps a little bit of a cop out saying, uh, you know, which which provision it is. You know, I think certainly auto enrollment, th the research is indisputable. It has been shown to be a phenomenal way to get people involved in savings because it reduces uh, the problem of inertia. Right, like once it's gone or it's it's it's, it's in process, people are. Uh, less likely to undo it than they are to actually go and actively do it. But I, I still think education is the key to helping to resolve our savings crisis in this country. Inherited IRAs are an area that, that seems to be confusing a lot of people since the passage of the SECURE Act in in 2019, yeah, count me among which, that group. <laughs> <laughs> you alluded to the Secure Act, I think 1.0, the OG, if I'm not mistaken, that was the, the word that you used for it that did away with the stretch yeah. IRA. What have been the key changes to the rules around inherited IRAs? So, so the big change was that historically, before the Secure Act, the first version, and by the way, you know, uh, this was passed back in 2019. 
And people listening today might say, why are they talking about this? Like, hasn't everybody at least, you know, dealt with this already? No, no, not everybody has. And for good reason. First off, again, a lot of times people are very loath to address things in their financial lives, especially when it comes to, you know, death and their passing. You just, we just, people just don't like to talk about it. But let's not forget the state of affairs in the world. Secure Act 1.0, the OG, as we said, uh, was passed in late December of 2019, began to impact people uh, just like a few weeks later, less than two weeks later at the beginning of 2020. But something else happened at the beginning of 2020 that we may all remember. You know, that little thing called COVID, right? A pandemic. And people all of a sudden, and for good reason, weren't worried about, oh my goodness, what happens to my IRA when I die? They were worried, I don't want to die. And that was the only thing we cared about for a really long time and for good reason, right? COVID-19 was a you know, a horrible, you know, scourge that came across our, our country, the world. Uh, people were, you know, tragically lost their lives. People lost their jobs because of the financial chaos that came about it. People weren't concerned about, gee, they changed the rules for post-death distributions. But they were pretty significant. And really, what that law did was it took the old classification of beneficiaries of an IRA, which in the past, it fit into two broad groups designated beneficiaries, which were generally living, breathing people, along with some special trusts, and non-designated beneficiaries, which were everything else, things like charities, someone's estate, etc. And designated beneficiaries, the living, breathing people side of the equation, were able to take distributions from an inherited account over their life expectancy. So what that meant was they were able to spread out distributions over many years, uh, which can help to control the income that comes out each year, which keeps the average tax bill lower for most people, et cetera. Plus, the money that remained in the inherited IRA that wasn't distributed could continue to benefit from the tax-deferred wrapper of the account. So no annual tax on the interest, the dividends, the capital gains, et cetera. And depending upon an individual's age, they were able to stretch for many years. In, in, in many cases, it was you know, several decades or longer. You know, for example, a 40-year-old was actually able to stretch distributions for more than four decades. That was pretty significant to spread out income over 40 plus years. Well, the SECURE Act, the first one said, we're going to take that group of living, breathing beneficiaries, that group of designated beneficiaries, and we're going to split it into two groups of its own. We're going to have eligible designated beneficiaries and non-eligible, but still designated beneficiaries. Now, eligible designated beneficiaries, I, I like to think of them as almost the group that time stood still for, or the group that kind of like Rip Van Winkle, they fell asleep and woke up and everything was kind of, you know, like the SECURE Act didn't even happen for them because for surviving spouses, uh, for, as we talked about earlier, for chronically ill persons, for persons who are uh, disabled, for those who are not more than 10 years younger, so let's say you left your IRA to your brother who was only six years younger, or for minor children, those specific groups of individuals, again, I'll just repeat it one more time for those listening, it's uh, surviving spouses, persons who are chronically ill, persons who are disabled, beneficiaries who aren't more than 10 years younger than the IRA owner, or minor children of that IRA owner, if the beneficiary is any one of those, they get to kind of continue to stretch, just like before the Secure Act. But for everyone else, they are no longer eligible to stretch, and they are stuck with taking money out over what is called the 10-year rule, which means by the end of the 10th year after death, everything in that inherited IRA has to be out. Everything in that inherited IRA has to be out. That might mean taking what would have been 30, 40, or 50 plus years of distributions and compressing them down to just 10 years, which can significantly increase the amount of income coming out each year, which could cause more of it to be taxed at a higher rate and the loss of tax deferral. And all these things sound bad. It's because they are. Now, I, I do realize we're talking about people who have just inherited money. So no one is going around going, oh my God, save, you know, save the beneficiaries, save the inheritors. There's no group out there, you know, like Greenpeace for beneficiaries. But uh, 
there is a challenge for those individuals who have, who have inherited as to what we should do with this money to try and preserve as much of it as possible and see as little of it lost in the form of taxation. So we want to spend some time talking about tax planning before and during retirement. We sometimes hear about the years just after someone's retired, so maybe they retire at 65 or whatever, and before those required minimum distributions begin at age 72 as a particularly opportune time to do some tax planning and, and to embark on some strategies to reduce future tax bills. Can you talk about that? particular period in life, or perhaps you would even start the clock even earlier before someone retires? So I, I think certainly the year that someone retires, and if they're in between, let's say, retirement and taking required minimum distributions and having Social Security, et cetera, uh, so-called uh, gap years, you often hear it referred to like that, uh, those are opportune times for sure for individuals to be able to uh, you know, to take these sorts of distributions uh, or to do some tax planning, I should say. But um, for some, it's earlier. At the heart of this, I would say there are a few principles that people should kind of live by when it comes to tax planning. The first principle that people should adopt is the, the winner of the tax planning game is not the person who has the lowest tax bill in any one year, but he or she who pays the lowest lifetime tax bill. That is the key here. So sometimes having a lower lifetime tax bill means paying more taxes today. That's okay if it's in service of the higher principle, which is the lowest lifetime tax bill wins. The other thing I would say is that you know a low tax year or low income year is a terrible thing to waste. You know, sometimes I, I hear people say like, oh, I had almost no tax bill this year. And I look, and I say, I'm so sorry. Like if, if, if you've done a good job saving over the course of your lifetime and you have a $0 tax bill, you have wasted or a very low tax bill, you have wasted the opportunity to use lower tax brackets. And there's a couple of ways you can do that. So perhaps one of the most common ways, uh, and, and probably the one I imagine you were thinking of when you started this discussion, is Roth conversions, right? Certainly Roth conversions are uh, one of the most effective ways of utilizing those low income years. You're able to pay tax and income at a time of your choosing, effectively wave the magic wand, create income and have it taxed if it's by your choice at a time when you believe your tax rate today is lower than it would otherwise be in the future. Uh, but that's certainly by no means the only strategy that people can use. For instance, others might want to look at uh, using the 0% long-term capital gains bracket. This is one of the very best strategies that you can use if you have money in a taxable account that has gone up in value and you find yourself in either the 10 or the 12% ordinary income tax bracket. Because at those brackets, the long-term capital gains tax rate is 0%. And the only thing better than not paying tax is paying tax at a 0% rate. And the reason is once you've paid tax at a 0% rate, that money is considered to be after tax. Even though you only paid $0 because you had a 0% rate, it's all after tax, which means it's basis to you. It can be spent at any time, tax and penalty free. And so even those individuals who really, let's say, like an investment that they've held for a long time that is appreciated in value, maybe that's why they like it so much. Well, they can sell some or all of that investment depending upon their income and how much gain they have. And then almost immediately repurchase that investment with a higher basis amount. And that allows an individual to take advantage of that 0% capital gains rate. And you don't have to worry about things like the wash sale rule. That's what comes up all the time. Like, don't I have to wait 30 days? What if I like this investment? What do I think if it's going to go up? You don't have to wait 30 days because the wash sale rule only cares about what you rebuy when you sell something that had a loss. But here, we're trying to sell something with a gain to take advantage of paying tax at the 0% rate 
on the game that you have. So those are two kind of tried and true strategies uh, about figuring out how to bring more income into your return now while you have those so-called gap years and not wasting them. Because once again, low income years are a terrible thing to waste. One of the key questions that investors and their advisors often wrestle with is, is how to decide which accounts to pull for their withdrawals in retirement. We sometimes hear about how taxable assets should go first, followed by traditional tax deferred, followed by Roth and, and people like rules of thumb. But is that one too simplistic to be useful in your opinion? Uh, yes, <laughs> uh, it is. It is certainly better than the alternative. So if you told me I'm spending my Roth dollars first, and then I'm going to take my IRA, and then I'm going to take my taxable assets, well, that would be a problem. That that would almost uh, I can't. I'd be hard pressed to think of a situation where I would think that would work well. Um, so it is certainly better. And as a rule of thumb, or as a guideline, a starting point, okay, uh, starting with your taxable dollars, then going tax deferred and tax free, that makes sense. But ultimately. It is often a combination of many things. For instance, sometimes early on, like if we have those gap years we were just talking about, maybe you're better off living off of your taxable assets and trying to use tax loss harvesting and selecting the right lots and all that sort of stuff to create a very low income situation, but where you still have income, you know, I say income, you have money coming in, mostly principal at that point, or hopefully gain that's been offset with losses. You can use that, keep your income for the year low, but meet your spending needs, and then use that low income that you've created to take money out of your traditional IRA, not to spend it, but to convert it. And down the road, sometimes it's a combination of things. Uh, you may take some out of your IRA and some out of a Roth IRA. At the end of the day, what we're really trying to do is to keep the lifetime tax bill as low as possible. And so if that's the case, if you find, let's say you have a particularly high need for income in one year, you know, let's say uh, the roof leaks and you need $30,000 unexpectedly, and that might push you into a much higher bracket. Well, while generally you want to leave the Roth dollars for last, if you see it's going to force you to go into a much higher bracket, or it's going to phase you out of some sort of credit, or it's going to trigger some sort of surtax, well, that can be a situation where you want to buck the trend and take money from the Roth ahead of time, even if it means taking some of that money from the Roth before you take all the money out of your traditional IRA. So uh, yes, it's an okay starting point, but you want to be much more granular. And this is where, again, a good financial advisor or a good tax advisor can look at your situation, not just once, but each and every year, and sometimes multiple times throughout the year and figure out how to get you the income you need or the dollars you need from your portfolio of assets at the lowest long-term cost. I wanted to ask about uh, required minimum distributions again, Jeff. As you know, many older adults love to hate their RMDs. They get them really mad. Mm -hmm. So can you quickly outline the strategies that one could potentially employ with an eye toward reducing their RMDs or perhaps reducing the taxes due on their RMDs? Sure. So uh, I think one would simply be uh, you don't have retirement accounts or pre-tax retirement accounts. That's the easiest way. Now, you could do that through a number of different ways. A, you could just not use them. Or B, uh, you could have your money inside Roth IRAs. And Roth IRAs have no required minimum distributions during an individual's lifetime. And so that would eliminate that issue. Beyond that, some of the other things that individuals can do are certainly those who are charitably inclined and who are 70 and a half or older. And the good news is if you're 72 and need to take RMDs, you are definitely 70 and a half or older. Uh, if that's the case, you can use what is known as the QCD, short for Qualified Charitable Distribution, as a way to take money out of your IRA and give it directly to charity. And this you know, Jeff, Christine, this is even better than having uh, money come out of your IRA and then writing a check to charity, even if you're able to deduct that amount as an itemized deduction. And there's a few reasons for that. First of all, not everybody gets to itemize, as we talked about before. But even if you do itemize, 
the itemized deduction for charitable contributions is a below the line deduction. It's an itemized deduction. It happens after AGI is calculated. And why that's important is that even though the tax brackets apply to taxable income, which is after itemized deductions, other than the QBI deduction, that business income tax deduction for pass-throughs, that's a 20% deduction for some, uh, other than that, Pretty much every single credit that goes away in the tax code or deduction that goes away in the tax code or surtax that kicks in or even things that aren't even taxes like Medicare Part B premiums, none of them look at taxable income. They care about AGI. And you can give a billion dollars away to charity as an itemized deduction, but it doesn't lower your AGI a single dollar. Using the qualified charitable distribution is a way to take money, again, from your IRA and give it directly to charity at 70 and a half or older, and it never even gets added to your income in the first place. So not only does it keep your taxable income amount low, but it keeps your AGI low too, so you don't phase yourself out of those credits and deductions or trigger surtaxes, et cetera. Uh, I would also add one other thing there, and it's this, is that uh, the the qualified charitable distribution can be used to satisfy an individual's RMD for up to $100,000 per year. It's not limited to the RMD. So if your RMD is $2,000, you can still do a QCD for five if you want to be especially generous. But if you had a, a larger account, you can take up to $100,000 out of that IRA each year and use it towards satisfying your IRA RMD. And, and by the way, uh, that is another area where there are some proposed changes as part of Secure Act 2.0, uh, potentially inflating that $100,000 amount each year, maybe even allowing individuals to take a one-time distribution that qualifies as a QCD and using it to fund a charitable trust that they have or some other split interest, uh, perhaps like a charitable gift annuity. So there are some proposals there to keep an eye on as well. Um, and then finally, I would say another way for those uh, individuals who are still working in their 70s and beyond is to use what is known as the still working exception. Now, this is not something that's available for everyone, but if you're still working for an employer and that employer offers a 401k plan or a similar type of plan, 401k, 403b, et cetera, that employer may allow you to delay taking required minimum distributions from that plan until you retire. So if you're still working at 73 and 74 and 75, uh, you might not have to take required minimum distributions from that plan. And sometimes that plan will allow you to take all your other money that was maybe sitting in an IRA or an old 401k or an old 403b and move it into that plan. And now you don't have to take RMDs on anything, which if you're still working might be exactly what you want because you don't want to add all that retirement account income on top of your earnings from work. So those are a few ways in which people who are uh, struggling, if you will, and it's a, a very first-class problem. We have to agree with that. Um, but those who have, you know, required minimum distributions that they don't want, those are some ways in which they might seek to address them. There's a lot of enthusiasm about the idea of direct indexing, which is a topic that we discussed at some length with your colleague Michael Kitsis when we had him on the podcast this year. Michael made the assertion that the tax benefits of direct indexing, while not nothing, are often dramatically oversold. What's your take on that? Um, wow, that's a great question. So I, I would probably agree with Michael that they are oversold, but I still think they're rather significant. And there are also some additional ways in which some managers, et cetera, can seek to get even more tax benefit out of a direct indexing strategy. So for instance, you might see uh, a manager run with something like a 130-30 portfolio or 140-40 portfolio uh, with the idea of going you know, long on an additional amount via leverage by shorting other positions. And it does require a little bit of a you know, of, of a bet. And so you can have maybe some tracking errors on the index that you're trying to track. Uh, but by having those short positions in there, the goal, of course, is to find positions that you'd be able to tax-loss harvest to a, a greater degree. Now, the challenge, 
right? The challenge with a lot of direct indexing is that once you get into it, if you've got these significant gains, it kind of becomes the, you know, like the Roach Motel. Like once you check in, you can never check out uh, because once you have all those embedded gains built up, it becomes exceedingly difficult to try and change strategies because of the tax costs associated with it. And that doesn't make it bad. It just means that you have to go into that as an investor with eyes wide open. Um, but again, while perhaps the tax benefits are oversold, I do think they're still valuable for a lot of investors, particularly those with higher incomes who might need tax loss harvesting more. And there are some new innovative ways in which some managers are trying to squeeze out a little extra tax alpha. And one of them would be kind of with a, a long short strategy like we just talked about. Well, Jeff, as always, this has been a really illuminating conversation. You managed to make this stuff fun, which is quite a feat. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, my goodness. It is my pleasure. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you all again and your listeners. And I just continue to wish everyone a very uh, happy, healthy, prosperous year. Thanks so much. Same to you. Thank you for joining us on The Long View. If you could, please take a moment to subscribe to and rate the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can follow us on Twitter at Christine underscore Benz. And at S-Youth1, which is S-Y-O-U-T-H and the number one. George Cassidy is our engineer for the podcast, and Carrie Gretchik produces the show notes each week. Finally, we'd love to get your feedback. If you have a comment or a guest idea, please email us at thelongview at morningstar.com. Until next time, thanks for joining us. This recording is for informational purposes only and should not be considered investment advice. Opinions expressed are as of the date of recording. Such opinions are subject to change. The views and opinions of guests on this program are not necessarily those of Morningstar Inc. and its affiliates. Morningstar and its affiliates are not affiliated with this guest or his or her business affiliates unless otherwise stated. Morningstar does not guarantee the accuracy or the completeness of the data presented herein. Jeff Patak is an employee of Morningstar Research Services, LLC. Morningstar Research Services is a subsidiary of Morningstar Inc. and is registered with and governed by the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. Morningstar Research Services shall not be responsible for any trading decisions, damages, or other losses resulting from or related to the information, data analyses, or opinions, or their use. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. All investments are subject to investment risk, including possible loss of principal. Individuals should seriously consider if an investment is suitable for them by referencing their own financial position, investment objectives, and risk profile before making any investment decisions.